Welcome to Conjuncture. My name is Jordan Camp. I'm really delighted to be here today with Marcus Green, who teaches political science at Pasadena City College and is the secretary of the International Gramsci Society. He's the editor of Rethinking Gramsci and the co-editor and translator with Joseph Buttigieg of Subaltern Social Groups, a new volume published by Columbia University Press in 2021. This volume is the first complete English edition of Gramsci's writings on subaltern groups and social classes, which has been of central importance for scholars as well as activists interested in questions of race and class, history, and political and social theory. I'm really delighted to be here in Marcus's home in Los Angeles to speak with him about Antonio Gramsci and subaltern social groups. So first, congratulations on the publication of this volume. It's a major achievement, Marcus, and I just want to thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. You know, the show Conjuncture is deeply inspired by Antonio Gramsci's own writings, you know, particularly his prison notebooks, which he penned in a fascist prison in the 1920s and in the 1930s. And as I said, your new volume, Subaltern Social Groups, provides the complete translations of Gramsci's special notebook 25 for the first time. So I wanted to ask you, why was Notebook 25 special? How did you come to the project? And why did you and Joseph Buttigieg think it was so important to translate and publish Gramsci's notes in English? The project uh, started in really in the early 2000s. So I was writing my PhD dissertation and um, I had translated Notebook 25. So my PhD dissertation is on Gramsci's concept of subaltern social groups. And after reading Joe's volume, particularly the introduction to volume one of the prison notebooks, it's like, if I'm going to write on subaltern groups, I've, I have to read Notebook 25 and include that in, in the work. So I translated Notebook 25 for myself to write the dissertation. And Joe and I were really close. So while I was writing the dissertation, we would have these long phone conversations and and he was on my dissertation committee, and so he was seeing the work that I was doing and how I was tracing the, the concept of subaltern social groups in the early notebooks to the late notebooks. And at the time, he was working on volume three of the prison notebooks, and particularly notebook eight um, of the prison notebooks. There's a, a lot of uh, notes on common sense that pertain to subaltern social groups. So I sent him my translation of notebook 25, and he sent me some stuff from Notebook 8 that related to the work I was doing. And, and he said, oh my gosh, you know, there's so much here. Um, we should publish this as a book um, because at the time, so much focus was on subaltern groups. And there wasn't a complete edition of Notebook 25 available in English. And there was all of these other notes that pertain to the topic that um, are really relevant to understanding the concept of subaltern social groups. So it was really his idea, um, you know, to publish the volume and and to give readers, um, you know, a translation of Notebook 25, but also the relevant notes that would provide more depth than what was available in English. The, the idea of the special notebook um, is partially has to do with the way that Gramsci is understood in, in the Anglophone world is that it's often said that the notebooks are unorganized. And that's because we are reading that they're unorganized. For Gramsci, they were very much organized. And so, you know, he had a total of 33 notebooks. Four notebooks were translations. He had some mixed notebooks, some miscellaneous notebooks, and then what he called his special notebooks. And there's 17 special notebooks, and all of those notebooks are mono thematic. So he took one topic and devoted one notebook to that theme. So for example, notebook uh, 10 is on the philosophy of Benedetto Croce. Um, notebook 11 is on the study of philosophy. Notebook 13 is on Machiavelli and so on. And notebook 25 is the, his special or mono thematic uh, notebook on subaltern groups. Yeah, well, I've been 
curious to ask you, you know, since the concept of conjuncture is elaborated in his prison notebooks, you know, there he discusses the relationships between the defeat of the working class movement after World War I in Italy, the rise of fascism, and the role of intellectuals in a broader struggle for hegemony. So how does Notebook 25 help us understand the specific conjuncture that led to Gramsci's imprisonment? And how does it help us comprehend the concept of the conjuncture? You know, looking at the notebooks as a whole, um, we could see that the notebooks are really a study of the conjuncture that Gramsci found himself in at that moment. As I write in the introduction to the volume, you know, one of the things that animated his thinking while he was in prison was studying the, the history of Italian intellectuals. And what he says is one of the underlying themes of, of that topic is the popular and creative spirit of the Italian people, really trying to understand the history of Italian people up until the present moment. You know, for him, the, the thing that he always goes back to, right, is the, the corruption of Italian civil society and the corrosive nature of certain currents of Italian intellectuals that sort of led up to the fascist moment. So you could think about Gramsci being in prison and saying, look at the failures that have happened you know, with the socialist movement, the communist movement, the working class movement, that he finds himself in prison. And you know, there is real terror. You know, people are being assassinated and murdered and, and, and imprisoned and exiled and so on. So it was a tremendously disruptive historical moment. You know, going through this history of Italian intellectuals and the composition of Italian culture and the corrosive natures of, of that moment really shows, you know, what he's trying to understand, uh, that his moment is part of a long moment of historical process. This just didn't emerge by accident. Through this attempting to understand Italian intellectuals, and, and he says the composition of the state, as well as the history of Italian people, this is what leads him to what I think is the impetus to understanding subaltern social groups. So what are the groups in Italian history that were marginalized and subordinated, um, that were disempowered and oppressed and so on? And so he goes through the social layers of looking at um, Italian history and the composition of the Italian people and seeing that there is this level of difference, right? Um, and real oppression, you know, people being assassinated and you know, the workers' movements being overthrown and people being in prison, that that moment, the, the, the moment that he finds himself in prison, there's other moments in Italian history that, where that has occurred as well. So he's going through just another period of that, you could say that historical process and that conjuncture at that, that moment. You know, his analysis of subaltern groups in this sense, if you look at the methodological criteria of what he's looking at, the composition of their conceptions of the world, their levels of political organization, and so on, really uh, complements, I think, those passages from Notebook 13 on the analysis of situations, right, where he comes up with this idea of examining the conjuncture um, as part of a larger historical process. And so I think those notes um, from Notebook 13 on the analysis situations really complement the notes in Notebook 25. And, and looking at the, the ways that we can understand the history and political activity of subaltern groups. You know, one of the letters uh, or articles that he wrote before his imprisonment, he, he wrote that, that the Italian communist movement didn't even have a, a conception of itself historically. And that was sort of the depravity of, of the movement, that its weakness is that they didn't understand the history of the communist party or the history of Italian workers and the history of Italian peasants. and. Uh, there was really no national history that was um, informing the movement moving forward. And so you know, this is why in you know, the notes on subaltern groups are so interesting is because he's saying history is important. You have to know your history so that you understand your place within in the social structure. For this you know, immense labor that you and Buttigieg had undergone to you know, excavate his analysis of the history of subaltern, uh, social groups, a term which you note in the introduction was first used in June of 1930, right, which is significant. He's 
arrested by you know, Mussolini's fascist forces in November of 1926. He engages in a long struggle to secure the conditions to write, uh, to obtain a pen and paper, which he does with the support of the economist Pedro Schaffa and with Tatiana Schud, his sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. So, but he's first writing, right, in January and February of 1929, and then the concept of the subaltern enters in 1930, which he elaborates over the next few years. And as you describe, he uses the term subaltern to understand the struggles and conditions of uh, slaves, of peasants, of common people, and of the industrial proletariat, as well as the relationships between race, class, culture, and religion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he writes, and I'm quoting him, often subaltern groups are originally of a different race, different religion, and different culture than the dominant groups, close quotes. So while Gramsci wrote extensively about subaltern groups, as you write in the introduction, there's been relatively little critical engagement with the text, and as you put it, it's led to a number of distortions. So I've been really eager to ask you if you could explain what you mean by distortions. How might this translation challenge popular or taken for granted understandings of the concept of the subaltern? And what new engagements do you hope that this new volume might provoke? Yeah, so the, you know, the, the subaltern studies group um, out of India and the work of Gayatri Spivak really put um, Gramsci's co concept um, of subaltern social groups into current intellectual discussions. Um, you know, as I point out in the introduction, the concept and Gramsci's writings on that topic were largely um, overseen, you know, um, neglected with even within Italian scholarship. There are some exceptions to that. But it was really the subaltern studies group and, and Gayatri Spivak who really put um, you know, it into discussions and highlighted the importance in, of the concept in Gramsci's thought. Um, but you know, not all of the writings were available in English and they were relying upon translations um, in English that were also based upon flawed editions that were in Italy. The, you know, it's not until 1975 that all of the notebooks of Gramsci's notebooks are published in Italian um, for the first time. Even Italian readers had anthologies and so the first English translations were based upon Italian anthologies that weren't complete. And so people read in the part of the distortions was that Gramsci's use of subaltern classes or subaltern social groups was actually a code word to evade uh, prison censors. And this really cut off um, Gramsci's analysis, right? Because what it ends up doing is saying that Gramsci wasn't really writing about subaltern groups and talking about different races and um, religions and different cultures. And he even says that women are comparable to a subaltern group and that masculinism is a form of domination. Um, and by reading it just as a code word, just completely ignores all of these realms of difference th that Gramsci was trying to highlight. And, and so what I'm hoping, you know, with the volume, what it does is that we can speak in really constructive ways about class and difference, that this is something that Gramsci was very much aware of. You know, the pains that he goes through, you know, in the writings, talking about the literature that's being produced, um, writing about subaltern groups is, you know, some of it's very derogatory and um, the literature that's being produced and saying that, you know, subaltern groups are mad and abnormal and anomalous and barbaric and these sorts of things, right? And that can really lend itself to the, you know, contemporary moment of understanding how subordination is perpetuated in the intellectual arena as well as the political arena. And I think, you know, Gramsci does such a good job of this sort of analysis, right? That the one we can think about the political, the economic and the cultural all being intertwined. And, and I really think that, you know, his critical analysis of those elements can be so useful in understanding contemporary politics. Well, I wanted to follow up because, you know, as you're uh, describing Gramsci's project, 
one of the things that came to mind for me was that this 1975 edition, the critical edition of the notebooks, kind of supersedes previous translations. And we, I think, neglect the fact that a lot of his writings were posthumously published to our peril, right? right? And so I wonder if you could say a little bit about the history of the translation of the notebooks, first appearing in Italian in the 1940s and then you know, subsequently in English and various editions in the kind of post-war period. Mm -hmm. It's miraculous that we have the notebooks anyway, right? It's so, um, you know, when Gramsci died in, in the clinic, I mean, he was in a health clinic, he wasn't in um, prison at that time. For two years, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And Tatiana was able to collect his things as well as the notebooks and, and to keep them safe. And then they made their way to the Soviet Union where many, you know, Gramsci's family was, but as well as uh, members of the Italian Communist Party were in, in exile. And they began, you know, editing the notebooks and producing them for a mass audience is really what it was. And so uh, Felice Plantone was the, the main editor of it with Pominero Togliatti was the overseeing the project. So, you know, Gramsci wrote in a very complex way. As you mentioned earlier, you know, he, he's arrested in 26, um, but doesn't get permission to write until 1929. And during this period of time, he started, you know, he subscribed to several journals. He was buying books and having books sent to the prison. He had his own library, as well as using prison libraries. So he's acquiring all of this material um, from 26 until 29. And, and as soon as he gets permission to write in his cell, he, he tells Tatiana, um, I, I finally, you know, my, my greatest achievement as a prisoner has occurred. I've been able to write in my cell. And, but he says, for the time being, I'm going to limber up and just do translations. <laughs> so he does translations for several months before he start, puts the first note in the notebook. So what he does is he goes back through the catalog of things he had read for the for the first couple of years that he's in prison and it starts to do an inventory of the things that he read that thought was, that he thought were important. And those notes largely appear in miscellaneous notebooks. And then later, beginning in 1932, he starts to organize his special notebooks. And so he's taking, you know, notes from early on, like for example, a note, a note from notebook one will later appear in notebook 10 or notebook 11 in these thematically organized notebooks. When you look at the critical edition of the notebooks, you're seeing everything. You can see, really see how Gramsci worked. But for a mass audience, that is not really, uh, it's very, a very complex entry point for readers. So Togliatti and Plat Platone um, organized the notebooks in thematic form. And what they did is they followed sort of the organization of the special notebooks, but they removed all of Gramsci's first draft notes and re removed anything that appeared cursory. And so you don't really get a complete text of the way that Gramsci worked. And in Italy, this created all sorts of um, arguments that they distorted the text, they, they manipulated the text um, for their own political reason, reasons trying to make you know, Gramsci look like a Marxist-Leninist and putting him into that sort of pigeonhole. Uh, Valentino Geritana, um, with the sponsorship of the Gramsci Institute, organized the critical edition of, of the prison notebooks. And so what Geritana had done is organized the notebooks or, or reproduced the notebooks in their entirety, except for the four translation notebooks. Through the, the dating of the notebooks, he put the, he put the numbers in them in sequential order. The Platoni edition was published between 1948 and 1952. The Geritana edition doesn't appear until 1975. So the initial publications in English were based upon the Platoni edition. So, so for example, the Modern Prince and Other Writings, which appeared in 1957, and then the massively influential uh, selections from the prison notebooks uh, appear in 1971. Joe Buttigieg just had said this many times, and, and I quote him in the introduction, is that if we want Gramsci to you know, have a mass audience, the critical edition is not the way to do it. We, we have to have anthologies, right, to introduce people to the text. But anthologies, you know, for a critical work are insufficient, but necessary. Um, and so I think, you know, Hoare and Smith, um, I, I want to commend them because the, the, the selections from the prison notebooks is just a superb edition. I mean, they're, they're dealing with the texts and their critical notes, I think, are, are, are fabulous. And they've introduced you know, so many people 
um, to Gramsci's writings. And so it's a complex history the way that he's you know, been, been you know, published because as you said, he never wrote a book, right? Gramsci never published a book. Um, he's only, you know, posthumously, he's, he's a publisher of books. Um, and still, I mean, this is the need now, right? Because Joe only translated notebooks one through eight um, and now we have Notebook 25, so we have, we're have we still missing you know, the other notebooks to, for them to be available in English, and that's a much larger project. I mean, to your point about the importance of anthologies, I mean, subaltern social groups, much of this appears in the complete edition that was edited by Jeff Bodiges and, and underscores the importance of this kind of work in a condensed form. So, you know, I thank you for that, for that labor again. And, of course, as you say, it's a part of a broader project um, that includes uh, Gramsci's 1926 unfinished essay, some aspects of the Southern Question, and as you noted before, the 33 um, notebooks that he penned um, in a fascist prison. And in these texts, we see Gramsci moving beyond the polemics of his earlier journalism and towards the more rigorous development of what he termed a philosophy of praxis. How does Gramsci's analysis of the history of subaltern groups and classes inform his conception of a philosophy of praxis? You know, the Southern Question essay, I think, is so pi pivotal. Um, Edward Said, and I can't remember the exact source, um, has a really nice quote, right? It's a summation of his pre prison writings and sort of a prelude to the prison notebooks. Yeah. You know, Gramsci, there, you know, he's dealing, you know, again, going back to the theme of, you know, the failure of the Italian communist movement, the rise of fascism. And he really begins to, to look at the, the composition of Italy in, in a really critical lens. Looking at Italy as this not complete state, it's di divided between the North and the South. And in, in his prison, pre-prison writings, he writes about this, the even, you know, the, the antagonism between workers and peasants in the North and the South. and and how that, how there wasn't uh, unity between them. And, you know, and as a party activist, that's one of the things that he was really working for was, was worker peasant unity. The other thing, I don't think this is appreciated enough is in the Southern Question, he quotes a number of Italian positivists, you know, like Enrico Ferri and Paolo Arano, for example, um, and how they contributed to these really racist, um, conceptions of how Southerners were viewed. And he says, he says, you know, I like the, the phrase, something to the effect, he says this, you know, this wasn't the product of the bourgeoisie, this was the product of, of left um, intellectuals under the cover of science, right? Oh. So many of them were positivist intellectuals and working under this, you know, of pseudoscience of biological inferiority. You know, so Enrico Ferri, for example, was a socialist. I mean, he was the editor of Avanti, um, for five years and eventually becomes a fascist. Um, but this, this was the literature that workers were reading, right, was this really racist literature. And so the term philosophy of praxis in the, in the prison notebooks, I mean, for him, I mean, he comes to this because it's, it's a two-pronged critique, right? On the one hand, he's using philosophy of, of praxis as a way against, you know, the philosophy of spirit sort of in the, in the idealistic sense, right? But also he's using it as against the positivist determinism that existed within the socialist movement in Italy. That, you know, there were currents of Marxism that were like in like Enrico Ferri that were very deterministic in, in their outlook. And so philosophy of praxis he uses as a way that that it is, you know, he says it's absolute historicism, right? That it's that there is no determinism. And it's the absolute secularization of thought. And one of the things that he really puts forward is that, you know, human beings are the creators of their own history. And, and part of this analysis um, really is that he, he wants to understand, you know, how conceptions of the world interplay with people's practical activity and real the material existence of life. And, and part of that, going back to you know, what we were saying about the analysis of the history of Italian people, is for people to understand their own practice, their own position 
um, within the historical moment, kind of going back to the idea of where we're talking about a conjuncture. And, and in this volume, there's the note that I think is so important, and it appears in Notebook 11, Note 12, and it's the famous passage where he says, to know thyself. And in that, that passage, he says, you know, one has to understand oneself as a product of the historical process. And in that note as well, he elaborates the idea of philosophy of praxis. And he says the philosophy of praxis in, is a way for subaltern groups to empower themselves and, and to have a critical conception of their activity and also a critical conception of their consciousness, what he terms historical consciousness, also critical consciousness, and a way to overcome you know, their positions of, of subordination. To your point about the essay on the Southern question, which it would have been fascinating to know how he would have finished it. It was obviously interrupted by his uh, arrest. As Said points out, um, he offers a geographical comprehension of the foundations of, of social life. He challenges the idea that divisions between North and South were immutable, inevitable, or inexorable, and locates it within the uneven you know, development of, of capitalism. Um, a major uh, contribution that you know, refuses to um, separate questions of geography and ideology from questions of race and class. And so a lot of your project has been to draw attention to Gramsci's own analysis of race and class, which is a major intervention. It challenges kind of received uh, wisdom on this. And so, so I would be remiss if I didn't invite you to say a little bit about what's at stake uh, in understanding Gramsci's own analysis of race and class. I mean, I think, you know, well, I, I appreciate you, you know, recognizing that, that aspect of the work that I've been, that I've been doing. And, and, you know, in the current moment, it's particularly in the United States, um, lots of discussions about race and class. And, and people are approaching it, I think, that these are things that we haven't, you know, left theory hasn't addressed before. And Gramsci was very sensitive to these things. I mean, being a Southerner himself, Going up in Sardinia, of course. Going in Sardinia. And as he admits to Tatiana in the prison letters, is that early on he, you know, was a Sardinian nationalist and, and, you know, quotes that phrase, you know, just drive them into the sea, right? And this becomes part of the inter intercolonialism that, that he experienced in Sardinia as, the, you know, the, the, the Norse colonization of the South. And then when he goes to Turin and he reads Marx and seriously, he, he realizes that you know, that Sardinian nationalism is not really the concern or the political project that he wants to be a part of. But being in Turin and being aware of all this, what he would call the Southernist literature that's being written about Southern peasants and, and, part and particularly like in Sardinia as well, that there was, you know, this so-called science that proved that Southerners were um, atavistic, you know, uh, form, biological forms or proto-human forms um, that weren't completely human or defectively human. And, and this just pervades the literature of that period. And he points out, you know, the, these authors and criticizes these authors. And even within the Marxist literature, and he says it southern, several times, that the South is the ball and chain that's holding back the development of the North. And it's the ball and chain is that it's this racial component. And, you know, reading Gramsci in context and reading the authors that he's referring to really shows that his concern of this racial component. And it's this racial division that doesn't provide the North-South unity that's necessary for there to be a socialist movement. And so he's dealing with race and class. I mean, straightforwardly dealing, dealing with race, race and class. And I think the Southern question is a geographical question, right, and a spatial question, but it's also a racial question, right? That that part of that, and and he doesn't use it in those terms. That but but when you look at the literature that he's referring to, it's precisely those terms. Yeah. No, thanks for that. And you know, I want to underscore the importance of him growing up in Sardinia. The fact that he was a southerner, as he put it, you know, it made me 
think as you were explaining the development of his work on the Southern question, which as you suggest, doesn't just appear all of a sudden in this 1926 essay, it's a long concern. It's a intervention in debates within his own party about building alliances between peasants and workers. And it's also related to his concept of hegemony, which you know goes back to the time where he's studying at the University of Turin uh, under his professor Bartoli, um, and really, you know, he, he's studying linguistics and uh, develops his interest in in geography. I wonder if you could say the importance of um, the philological method for Gramsci, his, mm -hmm. his attention to questions of of language. There's some elements that, you know, going back to linguistics, even the idea of subalternity comes into play in the sense that when you think about colonialism and one group dominating another, part of the hegemony is replacing one language with another language. And so language also becomes this element of subordination um, and an aspect of hegemony, right? What the idea that linguistic hegemony of one group over another group. And, and in a note in, included in this edition that appears in Notebook 29 on, on grammar, he says when subalterns from the countryside go to the city, they try to speak like city people. Right. Mm -hmm. So even when you know, he's writing later in, in notes on grammar, he's very cognizant of the way that language works with respect, respect to hegemony. I think this gets to precisely this, you know, his philological approach, right? Even, you know, thinking of the philosophy of praxis as a philological project. And to understand, you know, the particular aspects of our lived experience within this greater historical process is that understanding how things always fit within a context. The phrase that he uses that I like so much is, you know, the ensemble of social relations, right? It's, it's political, it's cultural, it's economic and philosophical for him, as well as historical, right? All of these things that in any sort of present moment, they're all working, right? But the idea is that you don't use for him, and this is where Joe has done tremendous work, is that you don't have an abstract concept that you use to understand the particular moment. It's the reverse for Gramsci. It's the particular, and then it fit. Then you, from the particular, you can construct the general. And particularly with the subaltern social groups, um, I think it's really important to realize, you know, many people ask, well, what's the definition of subaltern groups? And Gramsci never gives one. It's not like he set out, I'm going to come up with this concept um, to understand you know, political subordination. What really occurs is that he's looking at Italian history and begins to use this um, phrase to understand political relations. And this is why, you know, Joe points this out in one of his essays that Gramsci always uses it in the plural, mm -hmm. right? subalterns, mm -hmm. right? That there's many different groups, that it can't be boiled down to just one group because each historical context is different. And really, and this is, you know, in the note, he says that this type of history can only be understood monographically. And I think that's really important. There can't be just one history of subaltern groups because there's just too many histories to be written that each group or even a particular moment or historical event within one group would have its own monograph to understand that moment, right? And that really gets to his philological method that there can't be this grand history of subaltern groups. It's, it's like impossible in, in, in his conception of it, right, is that there's these monographic analysis. Yeah, and then so we go back to the importance of the analysis of situations and to the methodological criteria. I mean, he, he consistently says things like a study should be made, you know? Right. So it's to your point about the importance of the, of the concrete in mm -hmm. his uh, methodological approach. In our current era of far-right ascendancy and uh, following Jillian Hart, what we can describe as a resurgence of white Christian nationalisms, as she puts it, Gramsci's writings have acquired new and renewed significance uh, for many. I was particularly struck in reading this volume on the role of the church in mobilizing uh, nationalist uh, common sense in fascist Italy. 
And he argued that institutions like the church, as well as media and the family were important sites where hegemony was struggled over. So how does Gramsci's special notebooks contribute to our understanding of his concepts of religion, common sense, and what he called an integral state. So what's interesting is that notebook 25, the first note and the longest note is on a, a religious political leader named David Lazzaretti. Gramsci for all intents and purposes um, in different ways has you know these criticisms that are very subtle of Lazzaretti's movement um, because you know Lazzaretti viewed himself as uh, a religious figure that was going to create the Republican kingdom of God, which Gramsci thought was a contradiction. Um, and it also, I mean, in many ways, demonstrates a, the failure of a subaltern group because Lazzaretti was, ended up being um, assassinated by the Italian military police, um, even though it was a very tame and, and you know, Gramsci says, it's not really threatening um, political movement. In other places, not necessarily specifically in Notebook 25, but the other notes that are included in the volume really deals with the issue of religion in, in many ways. So one of the things that Gramsci points out is early on in, in Notebook 1 and, and throughout the notebooks is this treatment of the Catholic Church's conception of the simple. Um, and another way would be to this, you know, in English, you could translate it as the simple-minded, right? Um, people that follow religion and don't question religion. And in many ways that this aspect of the Catholic Church in Gramsci's view gave the Italian masses a very deterministic view of history or a fatalistic view of history, this idea of predestination. For his, in his view, part of it that enters into common sense that people don't question is that their position in the world is natural, that it is their position is sort of ordained by God, that it wasn't created by other human beings. And it really creates this impassive um, sort of political culture among people. And so he puts it, you know, people look to the church for salvation and then the church sort of reinforces and valorizes the people's humble conditions. And so then the people end up accepting um, their position. This you know, connects to the idea of the integral state in many ways, because for Gramsci, the integral state is, you know, is that he says that it's not the separation between political society and civil society is only a methodological one. And so any, in, in, in specifically within his historical moment, right, he's looking at religion as just sort of reinforcing the value and power of the state, uh, particularly when religion um, and Catholicism of that period really valorized, you know, the, the embodiment of, of authority. And so then people don't question authority in, in those instances. It seems to me a, a, a major contribution that continues to be not well understood, Gramsci's conception of the unity of political and civil society is, Buttigieg has pointed out elsewhere, it's often treated as if it was separate, autonomous from the state, but that's to miss how Gramsci understood civil society itself as a terrain of struggle, if I'm right. Right, yeah. absolutely. I mean, and Joe has a, a great article um, published in Boundary Two called Gramsci's Conception of Civil Society, excellent piece, and that, you know, that Joe says that, you know, civil society is, is the struggle and the terrain of hegemony, yeah. right? The case um, of Lazzaretti really demonstrates the, the power of the state to you know, stop and murder the leader of a movement that was not threatening in, in the least sense. Um, and in this sense, you know, we can think of, you know, civil society is this terrain of struggle that the state at any moment can intervene as soon as its authority is, is threatened. Um, and Gramsci even says, you know, this was done by a supposedly liberal state, right? And he's saying this sort of ironically, this liberal, this so-called liberal modern Italian state does this to a, an internal critic, really, really shows the, the precarious nature that the state itself viewed itself, right, is that it's, it was weak in, in that sense. The other aspect, and this goes back to the notes on the methodological criteria of subaltern analysis, is that he says that subaltern groups 
um, are disunified and they, and they are elements of civil society and that their unity can only occur is if they achieve power within the state. This gets into this conception of the state as well because he doesn't think of the state in this sense in the class terms as just the, the power of one group or one class, right? It's, it's a coalition of classes that organize themselves to meet their common interests. And this is where then where hegemony again comes in because they're organized to meet their common interests, but then they have to extend the consent for opposing classes and subaltern classes to consent to their authority. This is one of the lessons of Retorgimento, right? Right, precisely. Yes. And he distinguishes between active and passive consent, uh, which seems to me um, also another really important uh, element of Gramsci's own conception of hegemony, the, mm -hmm. the, the consent part, right? It's often understood as mere dominance, and that's at odds with his own views, yeah? Right. I wanted to follow up by asking uh, another question. I'd be remiss not to uh, engage with the late great Kramschian scholar, Joseph Buttigieg, who had served as president of the International Gramsci Society. And in that capacity, he argued that Gramsci was, and these are his words, a non-dogmatic, alternative democratic thinker for our times. So what do you make of this uh, description? And can you reflect on Gramsci's relevance in our time? And what are the significance of Gramsci's writings on subaltern groups and classes for the current conjuncture? You know, one of the things that Joe and I often talked about was the, the very non-determinist, anti-dogmatic nature of Gramsci's thinking. Um, you can really pick this up in, in the notes in Notebook 11 on his notes on Bukharin. The idea that you know, history has this inevitable um, goal or that these are the laws of history that, you know, that somehow Bukharin knew where history was going. Um, similarly with, but in different ways, with Benedetto Croce, the idea that that how some how history is just moved by ideas. Going back to the, the idea of the philological method is that you know Gramsci's always understanding the particularity and the concrete, and this becomes the really non-dogmatic um, aspect of his thinking. And you know Joe always talked about the open nature of, of Gramsci's thinking. You know there's the the note where Gramsci says you know reality cannot conform to an abstract scheme, right? That we have to investigate reality. And this is, you know, the really critical aspect of his thought is that we have to understand the particularities within the larger structures. The alternative democratic aspect of that is that what Gramsci sort of implored, right, is this responsibility of intellectuals to be connected to the people. And the uh, connection between the people and the intellectuals is not this top-down sort of dogmatic um, you know, educational process, but for people to understand their own power, to understand their place in history and to be active. And, you know, he even says, and this is again, going back to the to notebook 11, note 12 in the volume, he says, would you rather uncritically accept your position in the world and accept your um, conception of reality? Or would you critically like to investigate and appropriate certain things that are yours, um, that give you coherence to your life and give you a critical awareness of your own activity. And in those aspects, what that implies is this really radical democratic conception of politics, is that people become organizers of their own lives. And one of the points that he goes back to in the notes on subaltern groups is that whether it's the slaves in ancient Rome or if it's the medieval communes, or even he says the, the modern dictatorship, which would be fascism, are what are the organizations that subaltern groups are organizing to represent their own autonomy, their own will, and their conception of life, right? And so this idea of that, you know, groups have to organize to overcome their own subordination is this, it, it implies this radical democratic 
perspective that that these groups are part of the society and they need to have their voice and they need to you know organize society that meets their needs thanks for this marcus and it makes me think of um, gramsci's intervention that you know the history of subaltern groups and classes is necessarily episodic and fragmented therefore every autonomous initiative of subaltern uh, groups and classes should be of interest to the integral historian uh, as he puts it so you know thanks again for um, providing us with these materials to be able to acquire a, a deeper understanding of his uh, methodological approach I want to ask if there's anything that I haven't asked that you would like to have well, just to pick up on on that quotation, which is I think is a is a great is a great quotation that really shows where his analysis of subaltern social groups opens up the analysis of politics. So, you know, within the last several years, there's been these discussions about horizontal and and vertical um, forms of politics and conceptions of organization and so on. And they're often posed as an either or question, but for Gramsci, it's both. Right. Um, he's talking about autonomous organizations of subaltern social groups, right? That the point of subaltern social groups to achieve their own liberation and to overcome their subordination is to create their own autonomous organizations as well as to transform the state for him. And particularly early on, you know, in the phase of the factory councils and the Ordi Nuovo movement, it he also was engaged in autonomous organizations of workers and the factory councils. But also part of the failure of that movement was, with, was the lack of support from the Italian Socialist Party. So it is both vertical and horizontal. To, to repeat myself from before, when we look at the notes from ancient Rome, the medieval communes and the contemporary moment, his contemporary movement, Right, he's talking about this autonomous organizations and the integral autonomy of subaltern groups. And so really, that really shows the sort of horizontal aspects, but the vertical transformation of society is also required. So it's a dialectical relationship for Gramsci. It's not an either or question. And I really think that for the present moment, I think that could really open up um, new avenues to explore these questions um, theoretically and, and polit politically. Well, it makes sense. After all, he was an elected member of parliament. Right. And people forget this. Right? Yes. You know, I think of the, the one speech that he was able to deliver, which, if I understand correctly, is his one encounter with Mussolini. Uh, he emphasizes the Southern question and, uh, you know, he, he's shortly arrested after, but it underscores your point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank uh, you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, Marcus Green, the co-editor with Joseph Buttigieg of Subaltern Social Groups out from Columbia University Press in 2021. He's also uh, the secretary of the International Gramsci Society. A pleasure to speak with you today, Marcus. Likewise. Thanks so much, Jordan. I appreciate it. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Conjuncture. Please uh, stay tuned.